I suppose to some extent it makes sense that we measure the power of an engine, especially a car engine, in horsepower. I mean, after all, before cars and tractors and trains, horses were our primary vehicle. We used them to plow the soil, to move cargo, to travel distances. But how much power really is uh, horsepower? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that depend upon which horse? And how is it that horsepower came to be one of the most common ways that we measure the power of a car engine? Well, actually, the history of horsepower goes back to the 18th century, and a man whose name is virtually synonymous with measuring power, James Watt. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The first commercial steam-powered device is generally considered to be Thomas Savory's steam pump, which he invented in 1698. In 1702, Savory wrote that an engine which will raise as much water as two horses, working together at one time in such a work, can do. By 1712, Thomas Newcomen had created a steam engine that could transmit continuous power. Both of these early designs were primarily used to pump water from mines. The Newcomen engine was significantly more powerful and replaced a team of 500 horses that had been used to pump water out of a mine. It would take decades, however, for these machines to be considerably improved. In 1759, the Newcomen engine came to the attention of James Watt, a Scottish inventor and mechanical engineer who had made a living fixing and making scientific and musical instruments in Glasgow, Scotland. Watt was born in 1736 and, though sickly as a child, showed an aptitude for math. He learned to repair and make instruments like sextants, compasses, and barometers. He found employment at the University of Glasgow. He also started a business building musical instruments and toys. There is a popular story that Watt was inspired to investigate steam after seeing a kettle boil and steam lift the kettle's lid. The story has been told in a variety of forms, none of which are probably strictly true. Still, while he was not inspired by a boiling kettle, he did conduct many laboratory experiments that did include the use of a kettle to create steam. Watt came to understand the rules of thermodynamics, a field that would not be formalized for another century. A friend seems to have brought the steam engine to his attention when he suggested that a steam engine could be used to drive a wagon, replacing horses. It was in repairing a University of Glasgow model Newcomen engine in 1763 or 1764, however, that it came upon a better system that could significantly increase the engine's efficiency. The Newcomen engine had a single piston that was alternatively heated and then cooled, which wasted a significant portion of the machine's potential. His innovation was to add a separate chamber he called a condenser, in which steam could condense, which massively improved efficiency. Later, he was also able to make another significant innovation by using a sun and planet gear system to allow his engines to make rotary motions, allowing steam engines to spin wheels. Despite his talent for inventing, it took him years to realize any financial gain from his work. His research left him in near poverty, and he spent years in the 1760s borrowing money and working as a civil engineer. At one point, he so despaired of success that he wrote, Of all things in life, there is nothing more foolish than inventing. And probably the majority of inventors have been led to the same opinion by their own experiences. By 1768, he had created working models, and in 1769, he received a patent for a new invented method of lessening the consumption of steam and fuel in fire engines. Also, in 1768, he met with Matthew Bolton, owner of a manufacturing company and leader in the English Enlightenment movement. Bolton had had little formal schooling, but he had become successful as a businessman and scientist anyway, corresponding with Benjamin Franklin and Charles Darwin's grandfather. He bought an interest in the patent, and Watt continued his work. Watt was able to introduce his engines commercially in 1776 and agreed to be paid for the machines by taking royalties on one-third of customer savings compared to coal cost of running the newcomer engines. While this was a profitable system, it didn't work with customers who did not already have steam engines and who used horses instead. Horses were widely used for all kinds of power in the 18th century and earlier, not just for plowing fields and pulling wagons. Mills, where grain is ground into flour, were important to create bread, a staple food for European society, as well as in creating malt powder for use in brewing. Wind, water, and ocean have all been used to turn mills and grind grain, but the most effective means of running a mill by the late 18th century was the horse. Samuel Whitbread ran a successful brewery in London and had six horses that walked ceaselessly in circles to power the mill. He may have had as many as 20 horses for the mill, which were switched out to keep the mill working at peak efficiency. It isn't 100% clear how Watt eventually came up with the number that would define horsepower. In one version, Watt, watching horses like Whitbreads, observed them to complete about 144 circuits in an hour, about 2.4 times a minute. 
he determined that the horses pushed the shafts of the mill with a force of about 180 pounds. Using a complicated formula, he determined that a horse could produce 32,572 foot-pounds a minute, where a foot-pound is the amount of force it takes to raise a pound a foot in the air. Others had come up with different numbers, but Watt standardized his version of horsepower at 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. That might sound like complete nonsense, but it can be visualized. Imagine a single horse raising a 33-pound bucket from the bottom of a thousand-foot deep well in one minute. The energy it takes to raise that bucket is one horsepower. One version attributes his calculations to watching the work of pit ponies, which work to raise coal from mines. He guessed they could lift an average of 220 pound force 100 feet a minute, and he estimated that a full horse would be at least 50% stronger, coming up with a number similar to the 33,572 foot-pounds in a minute of the earlier tale, which was then standardized at 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. Watt may have done both estimations before standardizing the measure, but however he came up with it, his estimation was a tour de force of marketing. A popular legend for how he came up with this number is that he was challenged by a brewer to build a steam engine that could match the work of a horse. The brewer established the mount by putting his strongest horse to work for eight hours, driving him all the time to the limit of his endurance. Popular mechanics in 1912 said the 30,000 foot-pounds, that is the amount of force necessary to lift a 30,000 pound weight one foot in one minute, produced by the horse, exceeds by nearly one-third the work capacity of an average horse. But Watt made his engine produce at least 33,000 foot-pounds and dubbed the value a horsepower. This story is likely apocryphal, but it does fairly accurately represent Watt's marketing strategy. He told Whitbread that his engines could harness the power of 200 horses at once without having to store or feed the animals. Whitbread took the bait, and within a year it increased production from 90,000 barrels to 143,000. The replacement of horses and mills with steam engines was a turning point in the Industrial Revolution. Earlier steam engines like Newcomer's Pump were limited in where and how they could be produced, but Watt's engines could be used nearly anywhere, thus providing an immense source of power to countless industries and massively increasing human production. The engine installed in Whitbread's brewery on Chiswell Street was installed in 1785, only the second steam engine installed in a brewery. It could produce around 35 horsepower, and it helped Whitbread become the largest brewer in the country. In addition to Watt's success in naming the horsepower, King George III and Queen Charlotte visited the brewery and the machine on May 24, 1887. Astoundingly, that steam engine still exists, even though it's moved far from its original home. It was only actually decommissioned in 1887, 102 years after its installation. Archibald Liversidge, an English chemist and a trustee at what was then called the Technological, Industrial and Sanitary Museum in Sydney, Australia, intervened before the engine could be scrapped and had it donated to the museum. The museum, which is now called the Powerhouse Museum, still displays the engine. It is the oldest surviving rotative steam engine still in existence. Watt's steam engine and his work with Bolton catapulted him into an internationally famed inventor. His patent made him a wealthy man and allowed him to play a significant part in England's technological revolution. He created a number of other inventions, including a portable copying machine. In the 1790s, some of his clients stopped paying him as other separate condenser steam engines came to market and they thought that his patent would be impossible to defend, so he spent considerable time in court fighting other inventions. He retired in 1800, built a magnificent house he called the Heathfield, and spent the last years of his life tinkering with inventions like a machine for copying sculptures and traveling the world. He died on August 25th, 1819. His inventions and improvements on the steam engine were epic changing, providing a significant foundation for further inventions, and he has a claim to being one of the fathers of the industrial age, as his work helped power many of the innovations that transformed the world over the 19th century. In 1882, Charles William Siemens first suggested using the name Watt to apply to a unit of power. It's now familiar to many as the output of a very different invention, the light bulb. Despite his somewhat imprecise measurement of horsepower, the term caught on, becoming a standard way of talking about the output of power of engines throughout the 19th century. There are actually differing measurements for a horsepower as well. A mechanical horsepower is the number familiar to many in the US and elsewhere. It uses the standard measurement and the output and performance of vehicle engines. But there's also a metric horsepower which differs slightly. While mechanical horsepower is the equivalent to about 745 watts, a metric horsepower is equal to about 735. Of course, now we are pretty far removed from a time when a horse was the most recognizable symbol of working power. 
but we can be reminded of those early days every time we work with something that has an engine, from cars to lawnmowers. James Watt had an enormous impact on the world when he developed his engine, and that impact would have been important even if he'd never come up with the stroke of marketing genius of that term, horsepower, and yet come up with that stroke of genius. He did. The term became so standard that the very first advertisement for a Model T boasted that the car has 20 horsepower. It's also interesting to note that while the number of horsepower given for most vehicles reflects peak horsepower, most horses can produce much more than one horsepower for brief periods. A 1993 study, based on measurements made in 1926, found that the horse's peak power reached as high as 14.9 horsepower, but that for sustained activity, a rate of about one horsepower fits with how 18th and 19th century people used horses. For James Watt, the engine that he built and the term that he coined created a legacy that lasted far beyond his lifespan and is still visible today. All you have to do to see it is to, well, pop the hood. His statue in Westminster Abbey has an epitaph which says that Watt enlarged the resources of his country, increased the power of man, and rose to an eminent spot among the most illustrious followers of science and real benefactors of the world. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.